My name is Jake, welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna do another Review My Pie video where I review subscriber portfolios. This is the 29th video of this series and it's a great way to see how different people view the topic of dividend investing. Every single video, I learn something new. I see I see dividend investing from the lens of somebody else and it really gets me thinking, you know, is there maybe a potentially a different way of doing, doing this? And you know, the way that we view dividend growth investing. And so for me, I think that's really, really important that we're always keeping an open mind and that we're always looking at things and seeing, okay, is there maybe a, a better way to do it? And really not being complacent, I think is the key thing because complacency is really what what really can hurt you in the long term when you don't adapt and you know evolve your strategy as things in the market evolve and change. In today's Review My Pie, we're gonna review four portfolios. The first is from a 50-year-old here in the United States, the second, a 25-year-old here in the US, the third, an 18-year-old from Albania, and then the fourth, a 22-year-old from the United States. The timestamps will be in the description below, as well as the portfolio links will be in the description below. And as always, everybody, friendly disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. Don't take what I'm saying in this video as financial advice, it's just merely for your entertainment. And as always, everybody, I don't pre-record or pre-script what I'm gonna say. I'm reviewing these portfolios live and looking at them for the very first time. And so when I'm doing this, it's kind of, you know, like I'm analyzing and reviewing, you know, different different people's opinions and thoughts. And, you know, I'm gonna maybe have a different opinion than you, and that's completely fine, but I'm just sharing my opinion on the portfolios as I see them. And it may look a little like this. Hello. Hello. Ongo Goblogian, the art collector. Charmed, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna invite you to a show. Okay. But first, Allow me to destroy your gallery. Oh. Bullshit. Bullshit. Derivative. That I love. I absolutely love. Um, that's just the air conditioner. I want it. It's everything. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's everything. All right, the first portfolio is from Mason. He writes, hello, new to M1, starting a boring, hopefully non-volatile pie with borrowed money in the hope of using additional leverage through the best in the industry, industry margin in M1. Ooh, okay, uh, we're talking about margin already. All right, pulled 220K of equity out of my primary residency, so about 60% loan to value as it sits. Okay, that's not bad. Uh, so looking to place about 220 grand and something and something boring and stable that's uh, that'll allow to benefit over time. Need to beat two percent APR on the refinance, so the bar is relatively low. Okay, so what you're doing is you're looking to pull money out of your your primary residency. You're looking to leverage M1 borrow. Um, you know, as long as the M1 borrow is below two percent, and you're not investing into really overly speculative companies, I think it can work. Uh, but let's let's take a look. The attached M1 pie is basically a combination of margin portfolio that I plagiarized from Joseph Hugh on YouTube. So isn't isn't Joseph, isn't he the bow tie guy? Okay, then I added SCHD and Nusi because I like them. Only, uh, only have 5K in there now. Anyhow, my primary concern at this point is jumping into large positions in bonds. Now with looming interest rate hikes in the future, seems a little uh, suicidal to do at this point with rates as low as they are. I'm 50 with a typical 15 year time horizon. Total liquid assets are around 450K, hoping to hit over 1.3 million by 2030, which would be great. Okay, so Mason, thank you so much, man. I, I appreciate it. So there's a couple of things to unpack here. I think for most people, leveraging, you know, investing in dividend stocks on leverage, I don't necessarily think that's the right approach for everyone. However, I will say it can make sense in certain environments. So right now with interest rates so low, with the Fed printing money like crazy, I, I'm not so opposed to it. However, I think, you know, a huge asterisk, be very, very careful. If you're a new investor and you're thinking you have this revolutionary idea, oh, I'm gonna borrow money and invest in a dividend stocks, it's a no brainer. Well, I mean, that's how people get burned. That's how people go bankrupt. So you wanna make sure that, that that's how you get into trouble. So I, I think when it comes to this, be very, very careful. I personally think most people watching this video, most people that's not going to be the right approach. 
However, I think for a small handful of people, don't let Dave Ramsey hear me say this, I think it can be okay, all right? But it really depends on the individual, your situation, your risk tolerance, your assets, your cushion, so many things that I can't really go into this video, but it's not really a blanket statement black and white, do it or don't do it, okay? That's that's my honest view on it. So when looking at this, you're 50 years old, your time horizon is beyond 59 and a half, so you're, you should be 100% maximizing your tax sheltered accounts at this point. If you're gonna be pulling the money after out after 59 and a half, it's a, this is the no-brainer. The no-brainer is to be maximizing your tax sheltered accounts uh, that's that's the very first thing. So that's your 401k, that's your IRA, that's your HSA, everything in between. Like that's what you, that's in my opinion, what you should be focusing on. SCHD and NUSI, these are great ETFs. Uh, SCHD is one of the best performing dividend growth ETFs of this year. And NUSI is a good, good cover call ETF. I own this in my portfolio. All right, let's take a look at your portfolio. So we're not gonna see the historical performance because if you do have NUSI in here, it's not gonna go past 2019. You're getting a good, decent dividend yield. You have an okay expense ratio. It's a little bit high, but you only have five holdings. So let's take a look here and see Joe. Oh, this is the Joe Joseph Hughes. This is uh, the other YouTuber. So, I mean, J&K, Spider, this is a bond ETF. Why the hell are you having an ETF with 34%? If you have a time horizon of 15, why the hell do you have bonds? Um, okay, uh, so my opinion, I, I'm not a fan of this. I, I don't I don't like holding bonds at this this weighting if you have a 15 year time horizon. I don't care what interest rates are doing. Uh, having a bond allocation like this, in my opinion, is is not the the best approach when you're looking at the growth over 15 years. And you said you wanted to to grow your portfolio up to I think 1.3 million. You know, there's no way you're going to get that with bonds. Um, you have okay, you even have actually more bonds. I only looked at the first one. So you have BLV. You have over 60, 70 percent is in bonds. Why? No, I I don't I don't like this at all. Um, the SCHD I really like. The low volatility ETF, okay, that's fine. NUSI, I think, is great. Um, so in my opinion, okay, so if I was 50 years old and I was looking to live off the dividend income from my portfolio, like I said, in 15 years, like I said, maximizing those tax sheltered accounts. All right, so it's really important. You have to understand the rule of 72. If you're 50 years old, you're looking to pretty much double your portfolio in 15 years, you have to understand the rule of 72, how long it's gonna take an investment to double based off of the annual interest rate. So if you have 15 years, um, in order for your portfolio to double, and you, you actually want your portfolio to more than double, so you can't settle for 5% annual returns, you need something like a 10% annual return. And there's no way in hell you're gonna get a 10% annual rate of return over 15 years with bonds. You may There may be an anomaly there where you get one or two years, but over 15 years, I just, I don't see it happening. I obviously don't have a crystal ball, but if you want to see those returns, you need to skew based off of historical performance, which is never a guarantee of future performance, but you're better off in most cases, skewing more towards equities and less towards bonds if you wanna grow your portfolio. So that's my opinion there. I would highly encourage you to reconsider or review what you're looking to achieve there. Maybe lower your expectations. If you want to continue down that path of investing largely in bonds, you may want to kind of look lower here on the, the annual return and kind of level set your, your expectations going forward. Mason, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. All right, the next portfolio here is from Justin. He writes, hi, my name is Justin. I'm 25 years old and married, unfortunately. Wait, I thought, I thought there was a comma after the married. Married, comma, unfortunately. <laughs> oh my gosh, big difference. He's married, full stop. Unfortunately, I am late to getting started with my dividend growth portfolio. I really love your channel and wish someone would have taught me about dividend growth investing 10 years ago. You and me both. Uh, we're starting with $2,000 in our dividend growth investing portfolio. My wife and I have the goal of being financially free in the next 15 years in our early 40s. That is an amazing goal. You, your wife and, and you are the exact same with, with my wife and I. We started much later. We started 
really like realistically starting, we started in our early 30s, like 29, 30, like really aggressively uh, working towards this goal. So you're 25, man, you're, you're five, six years ahead of us. The plan is to achieve this through receiving 55K a year from dividend payouts. Really, really great. Also, we want to be diversified by having some real estate rentals and a growth portfolio as well, but don't account for these in our goal to reaching financial freedom. I love it. Just dividends. Okay. As of right now, since we're getting started, we're just trying to save and invest as much as we can from our income, which will probably be around $1,500 a month. I'm blind and my wife and I are both self-employed, so our monthly income can fluctuate a bit. Our goal is to start doing some side hustles to increase our savings rate as much as possible, which I plan on documenting on my channel, hopefully. Since we have 15 years to achieve this goal, my thinking with my portfolio is to have a balance between dividend stocks and ETFs with decent yields along with dividend stocks that are growing their dividends at a good rate on a consistent basis. I would love to get your opinion on my portfolio. I'm new to using M1, so this is what we are starting with. I'm a numbers guy like yourself and can't wait to start calculating and dialing in my portfolio to find the best path to reach our goals. Well, Justin, thank you so much, man. This is so, so great to read this. When, when I look at this, when I read everything that you're saying here, it, it really makes me think about my, my own situation, right? When I was 25, Man, I, I, I was living in Germany at, at 25. I was working and I was new in my career. I, I didn't really know, necessarily know what I wanted to do. You're years ahead of where I was when I was going down this path. What I've learned is it doesn't really necessarily matter as much what you're making. It really matters more what you're spending. If you can keep your costs low, then really you don't need to have a multi-million dollar portfolio. And the cool thing about dividend investing, if that's your goal, which it sounds like, you can kind of finesse with the numbers, which it sounds like you're also a numbers guy, to make this work in your favor. So the most important thing here is knowing your goal. What is your goal? Because a lot of people that are, start, that are watching this channel, you probably have heard me say this a million times, but you still don't know your goal. The first thing that you should really strive to do is know your goal. So that once you know your destination, you can then pick the appropriate vehicle, the vehicle being the investment, to help get you to your goal. That's what it's all about. And I can't stress that enough. When I first started down this path of trying to, to reach FIRE, financial independence and retire early through dividend investing, man, I was just investing blindly. I didn't really know necessarily what I was doing. And then when, once I learned more about the numbers are the numbers, the math does not lie. Once you understand that, it becomes an equation. An equation can be solved with math, with logic. And obviously there's going to be variables in that which you're not going to be able to foresee. You're not going to be able to foresee your health. You're not going to be able to foresee maybe certain expenses or, or life situations. But nonetheless, you do the best that you can. And it, that's exactly what it sounds like you're doing. All right, Justin, let's take a look at your portfolio. So you got your financial freedom portfolio here. I'm going to blur out the name here so, so you can keep your privacy. Um, but your portfolio is up 84%. You have just under a 3% dividend yield. You have a low expense ratio. You have a lot of holdings. So 58 holdings is on the higher end. I think 58... It can be manageable, but you have to understand that, I mean, this is going to be, you know, it better be a hobby. Otherwise, I believe you probably have a little bit too many in here. But let's, let's take a look. Let's see what you have in here. You have your portfolio structure where you have ETFs, consumer staples, utilities, telecom, real estate, materials, industrials. So you have, you have all the, the important industries in here. You have, let's take a look at your, your growth ETF and also the percentages look good. You have technology in here, consumer discretionary. So it's skewed more towards, uh, you know, consumer staples or, or more towards non-cyclical is what it, what it looks like. All right, let's take a look at your gro dividend growth ETFs. Uh, they're up pretty, pretty well. What do you got in here? You got VYM, SHD, and GGRO. Okay, so these are the exact same three that I have in my portfolio. These are really high quality ETFs. 
I think um, this is exactly how I have it set up. I could obviously never say anything bad about it, but I would maybe take a look at, you know, maybe 19%, maybe a little bit high, you know, cause you have 15 years. My wife and I have this exact same, the exact same holdings, but we have a five year or less than a five year time horizon. So maybe something to consider, you could maybe bump up maybe some more DJRO for example. But let's see here, you got consumer staples, you got Target, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, Dollar General, Costco, Colgate, Kimberly Clark, and Altria Group. Yeah, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, every single one of these are either dividend aristocrats or dividend kings. I mean, this is spectacular. There's nothing wrong with holding all of these companies in here. I think these are, these, this is fantastic. I, I think you could even make this even higher, right? These are companies that you probably are consumers of, right? Like every single one of these, you could even bump this up to 20% if you wanted to, right? Because I, I would assume you probably know more about these companies than some of these other companies down here. But let's take a look. Utilities, Southern Duke, Consolidated Edison, Dominion, Nexa Energy, and Essential Utilities. These are all great, great utilities. Uh, for 15 years, you may want to consider bumping up Nexa Energy maybe a little bit, maybe lowering consult like here very nitpicky you could lower consolidated edison and you could bump up next air energy that would be one example but over 15 years you're going to get more compounding with next air energy than you will with consolidated edison it's just simply the uh the math behind the compounding rates let's look at your telecom you got verizon at&t and qualcomm yeah i mean these are fine not the hugest fan of of at&t but you know it is what it is uh, Verizon is is great. I would maybe lower this. I I think telecom you could lower this to maybe five percent, and then maybe take that four and then bump it up into uh, consumer staples. That's personally what I would do. Let's look at your real estate. You got DLR Realty Income and you got MPW. Really, really, really great reads. I love love MPW. All three of these are great. I like it. I I, I think it's absolutely fine. Materials. You got Sonico, great, Proct um, PPG, um, International Paper, and APT. These are these are really great companies. The one thing that I would ask you, right? You're young, you're probably still doing your research. I would recommend you and your wife do some research on each one of these companies. Research the company, understand how they generate their revenue, and if you don't fully understand it, and if you don't fully believe in it, there's no reason to keep it in your portfolio. That's my opinion. So do, and you don't have to do it right away. It could be something that you could do down the road, but I would highly recommend taking a look at those. Uh, here you got uh, 3M, Caterpillar, Waste Management, UPS, Lockheed Martin, Honeywell, General Dynamics, Union Pacific, Emerson, Dover, and A.O. Smith. You have some amazing companies in here. Emerson Electric and Dover, I think if I'm not mistaken, they've increased their dividend consecutively for over 60 years. Like really some amazing companies. Healthcare, you got Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Abvi, Pfizer, Bristol-Myers, and Stryker. Great companies, man. All, all really, really great. Yeah, I like them. I like them. With the healthcare, once again, I would do the exact same thing. Right, you probably know Johnson and Johnson. You probably know Pfizer. Take a look at some of these other companies and do some research on them and try to understand them the best that you can. Technology, uh, you got VGT, MSFT, Apple, Texas Instruments, and Intel. This slice is something very similar to what I had in my portfolio about a year ago. Um, all really great companies. Um, I like VGT in here. Financials, Visa, Mastercard, J.P. Morgan, and Aflac. I I like this. Uh, I think it's fine. Uh, consumer discretionary, McDonald's and Target. I think you had Target in here twice. Yeah, you got Target in here twice. McDonald's and Target, I think these are both really, really great. Let me reiterate one, once again, what I would definitely recommend, all of these companies, these are fantastic companies. A lot of these are dividend aristocrats and dividend kings. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the companies in here. The question is, is, is this the approach that you want? Because you don't want to just invest into these companies and never follow up on them, right? So make sure that you're doing your research. And if you enjoy doing research, then keep these companies in here. If you find that, oh man, oh darn it, it's Saturday and I have to research Procter & Gamble and find out which shampoo they're, you know, if you feel like it's a, a burden and a, and a job, 
then maybe consider lowering the holdings, really investing in the companies that you're passionate about, that you believe in, and maybe bumping up more of the ETFs, right? It really, and it may change over, over time. Maybe this year you're really excited about it. Maybe in two years you think, well, you know what? I don't wanna have to follow up on these. I wanna have more exposure to ETFs go for it. All right, the third portfolio is from Shand. He writes, hello, my name is Shand. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, please forgive me. Um, I'm 18 years old and I live in Florida. I'm originally from Albania. Albania is just north of Greece, if I'm not mistaken. And I moved to the US about two years ago. I am a college student and I'm studying architecture. Your English is great, by the way. Um, I've been investing for over one year and seven months now, and my time horizon is 30 plus years. So I'm in no rush to take profits or start using my dividends to cover my needs. I've been contributing roughly 200 to $300 every month. And when the market collapsed in March of 2020, um, but lately I've been cutting my investing to about $100 per month to save money because I want to get into real estate next year after I finish school. Oh, that is great, man. I'm trying to do as much research as I can before owning stocks. So I only own reliable companies that have a safe dividend because I'm looking to build a big portfolio over time since the uh, the time is my advantage. Man, you're, you're spot on. To be able to support my living needs. Any feedback is appreciated. Well, man, you are, you're, you're just like, holy cow, 18 years old. You're thinking about real estate. You're thinking about reliable, safe dividend investing companies. You're thinking about all all of these things, you are off to an amazing, amazing start. All right, let's take a look at your portfolio. You're up 113% over the last five years. You're, you got 17 holdings. You have just under a 3% dividend yield. So here's the very first thing. This is really, really amazing, by the way. 113%, just under a 3% dividend yield. I would assume you probably got some really big growth, but you probably got some, some pretty big dividend payers in there as well. What I would recommend, if you have a 30-year time horizon, you don't want that unnecessary tax burden. Try to get this down to maybe a 1.5%, 2%. By lowering the starting yield, you're focusing on investments that are, are more growth centric. And so if you have a longer term time horizon, really see about optimizing the dividend yield here so that you're getting more compounding, more growth, so that once you get to that 30 year time time period, you're, you're really, really taking advantage of the dividend snowball. So let's take a look, what do you got in here? You got Apple, Microsoft, Waste Management, love it, Walmart, Verizon, Pepsi, Realty Income, Procter & Gamble, Home Depot, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola, AT&T, FRT, 3M, Exxon, and Tyson Foods. Okay, so there's a lot of great stuff to, here to unpack, and let, let's start. Apple, Microsoft, great. I think this is fine. Having 8% in Apple and 7% in Microsoft, I don't think you can go wrong there. I think that is fine. Waste management, 6%, great. Walmart, 6%, great. Like I honestly see Walmart as like kind of the equivalent almost as a Costco and an Am like an Amazon. Walmart is growing so so fast. It's it's incredible. Now, here's the 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 one here with Verizon. I personally, this is my opinion, I would just take Verizon out. If you want a telecom, I would look at maybe a Disney, maybe or or a Comcast. I wouldn't with a 30-year time horizon I would not, I would have Verizon maybe at 1% or take it out. Because 30 years, it's a lost opportunity. Even with the dividend reinvested, you're gonna get much more return, you know, total return with these other companies. And so I believe Verizon, if you love it, maybe put it at 1%. But me personally, I probably would just take it out with a with a uh, thirty year time horizon. Pepsi is great. Realty income, all right. Realty in income is a good one. I would lower this to maybe one to one two or three percent. I would not have realty income at six percent. If you really want growth oriented real estate, I think my favorite right now is American Tower. American Tower ticker symbol AMT is probably my probably my favorite growth REIT at the moment. AMT, I think a close second is DLR and a close third is Prologis at PLD. Um, but yeah, I would I would lower realty income or even consider taking it out. Especially if you're living in here in the United States, you're paying 
ordinary income on the dividend from realty income. So in my opinion, it doesn't make a lot, a lot of sense at this point. Procter & Gamble, great, great company. I would lower it to 1%. If you're gonna keep it in there, one or 2%, I would not have it higher than 2% given your time horizon. Procter & Gamble, Gamble is an amazing company. It's a, it's a dividend king, but it's not growing anywhere, fa anywhere as fast as Microsoft or Waste Management or some of these others. So I would lower Procter & Gamble. Home Depot, I like Home Depot. I'm not a shareholder, I don't own Home Depot, but I like Lowe's and I like Home Depot and I think uh, I think they're really, really great. Home Depot is one of the largest holdings of SCHD, the ETF, by the way. Really, really great. JP Morgan, yeah, I think JP Morgan is fine at 6%. Okay, okay, I think you're fine. You know what I personally would do? What I would do is I would lower these a little bit and I would just, I would add SCHD. You're getting the same exposure in SCHD, but you're getting all the other growth in there because you don't, here's the challenging thing. You can't, you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know which of these companies is going to be bankrupt in 30 years. You don't know which of these companies are, is going to be at all time highs in 30 years. No one does. And so that's why I really like incorporating an ETF, a high quality ETF like SEHD, because you don't have to know the winners. The ETF is set up in a way where the winners win and the losers lose. But you as the shareholder of the ETF, you don't have to take on the risk and you get you only get the upside. And that's that's why I love those those market capped ETFs like SCHD. Uh, Johnson and Johnson, yeah, I think six percent may be a little bit high, but I think it's I think it's fine. Coca-Cola, I would lower Coca-Cola to maybe two or three percent. AT&T, I would take that out of there. Uh, get it out, get it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, derivative. No, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of AT&T. Maybe once the, the Warner spinoff, you keep the Warner and then you sell the at and I don't know. That's my opinion. I'm, I'm not a big fan of AT&T. FRT is fine, um, but it's kind of uh, redundant here, double with realty income, right? I personally would do one or the other. FRT is a dividend king. It's increased its dividend for 50 years, but I think with your time horizon, you'd be better off with one of those growth ET, uh, growth REITs that I just mentioned. 3M is, is good. I, I like 3M, maybe lowering it down to a three or a four. Exxon Mobil, do you honestly believe that Exxon Mobil is gonna be rocking and rolling in 30 years? I'm not a big speculator, but I would bet that Tesla is probably gonna be doing better than, than Exxon Mobil. So me personally, I'm not long oil. I never have been long oil. I think uh, for the next 30 years, I personally would not be investing into oil. So I, if it was me personally, I'd be taking out Exxon. You could, you could, I, I would add Tesla over over Exxon. Uh, and then the last one, Tyson Foods. Yeah, Tyson Foods is okay. Um, there's kind of a lot of things in the media with with them and how they're handling and and you know how they handle their their the animals that they that they have and the ethics behind it, but. Um, yeah, as a, as a company, as a stock, it's a, it's a high performing stock. So this is, as I mentioned, what I personally think would be a good idea, Verizon, AT&T, Realty Income, FRT, Exxon, definitely, and maybe even lower in Coca-Cola, reconsider having them in the portfolio or lowering their, their weighting. Because with a 30 year time horizon, you really, really wanna focus on the compounding nature of the portfolio over the longer term. And like I said, I really like the idea of even incorporating an ETF like SCHD or VGT. VGT is the technology ETF from Vanguard. But yeah, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. All right, the last portfolio is from Dylan. He writes, hi, Dividend Growth Investing. Just wanted to say love your videos. Thank you so much, man. I, I appreciate it. I was wondering if you could re review my M1 Finance Pie. I'm 22 years old. My strategy is to invest in the companies that will be around for the next 40 years and create long-term value. I'm using REITs for cash flow to reinvest into my portfolio and contribute $100 a week myself. My biggest question is, is am I structured correctly for the long term? I put a lot of time and research into this portfolio. Okay, so if you have a 40 year time horizon and you're focusing on REITs for cash flow, I think we may need to, to dissect this a little bit. So it really is gonna depend on which account you're using. If you're using a Roth IRA, for example, a tax sheltered account, yeah, you can invest into REITs. 
But if you're investing into a taxable account and you're focusing on REITs, man, that's that's creating a huge tax, an unnecessary tax burden that you probably don't want. So you have to understand that REITs are taxed as ordinary income. You're not getting any favorable tax treatment with REITs. So there's probably another way that you can look at this. And really, I you want to make sure that you're you're not basing all of your decisions based off of tax efficiency, but it definitely should be front and center on what you're considering and how you're considering it because taxes can eat, they're like, they're like inflation. Taxes eat away at your total returns. All right, let's take a look at your portfolio. So you're up 46% in the last year, so pretty dang good. You probably have either an IPO or a cover call ETF or so, something in here. You have a good starting dividend yield, so just one and a half percent. The reason why this is good is if you have a 40 year time horizon, you really want to focus on the growth of your portfolio. You don't need the dividend now, what, especially if it's a taxable account. If you're in a taxable account, why the hell do you need the dividend today? Like what, for what, right? So that you can reinvest the dividend? No, that's, that's creating an unnecessary tax burden that you probably don't want to realize, right? And so that's something you definitely want to consider. So let's take a look at this. You got technology, the highest weighting, which as it should be given for your 40 year time horizon, consumer services at 20, REITs at 15, utilities at 10, travel 10. Okay, so you're 20 years old, your time horizon is 40 years, you have REITs in the portfolio here. What I would recommend is why not consider, if you don't already have one, why not hold, if you're planning on using the money at after 59 and a half anyways, why not put your REITs in a tax sheltered account? Why even have them in your taxable account? As I mentioned, you're getting taxed on these at ordinary income rates, which are generally higher than long-term capital gains tax. So something definitely consider. That's the very first thing that I would say. Utilities at 10%. I hope that these are growth utilities because having 10% in utilities is pretty high. Travel 10, finance 8, industrials 5, communication 5, and cloud at 3. Let's take a look at it. So you got technology at 24. You got Apple, Microsoft, Shopify, MD, Sony, uh, TSM, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Broadcom, and Amazon. Yeah, I think these are fine. This is kind of similar to how my wife invests. My wife is investing in dividend growth stocks, but also into growth stocks. Once we reach fire, she's going to liquid, like for example, she owns Sony. She owns Sony and Amazon and Salesforce, et cetera. She's going to liquidate those in three or four years and then buy companies like Kimberly Clark or Coca-Cola, right? So she's investing in it for the growth. And I, I like this. I, I actually do like this. It's it's a way of, of looking at it. Yeah, I think it could be I think it could be fine. Uh, consumer services, you got Disney, Roku, McDonald's, Netflix, consumer services. Okay. Home Depot, Costco, Alibaba. Okay. They're all big brands, right? Everyone knows these companies. Disney at the highest, McDonald's, Costco. Yeah, I I think this is I think this is fine. If you were invested into like, you know, other Kathy Wood stocks that do not have any sales, like are really really overly speculative, I probably would be shaking my head. But these are all really great companies, right? I think it's fine. Uh, let's look at your REITs. Stack, Realty Income, Crown Castle, AGNC. Not a fan of AGNC. Not a fan of NRZ and I'm not as familiar with IVR. So this is a mortgage REIT, not the biggest fan. These three I like, I like these three. You could look at, so you got industrials, you got real estate, you got cell towers. What about data centers? You could look at getting DLR. DLR would be a, a really good one. Um, or you could go with AMT, which just acquired a data center reach. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of the three down here. I like the three up here. And once again, I would focus more on growth. I would, yeah, I would focus. You could look at PLD as well. Uh, you could look at DLR. Those are some that I like. But yeah, as I mentioned, you know, REITs in general, considering putting them in a taxable account altogether, if you already know that you plan on using the money post 59 and a half. Utilities, whoa, what is that? Holy wowzers, okay. Um, 
Pl okay, plug, got it. All right, so not really the utility that I was thinking of. I was thinking more of like Southern Company or Duke. Uh, but yeah, these are great. Next year Energy, General Electric, okay. Uh, and then Fuel Cell. Yeah, man, sure. I mean, you're, you, you, I probably should be taking lessons from you. I mean, you're, you're, you're the one up 940%. So no, I think this is this is great. Plug, you know, definitely an EV play kind of going to be interesting to see how this this plays out. Um, but here, my favorite is Nextera Energy. Let's see here. You got Travel, Tesla, Carnival, and Neo. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Tesla's Tesla's fine. I think you know. So what you're doing here is you're blending your dividend stocks with your growth stocks. For for simplicity's sake, I think that's okay. So if you're gonna use M1 Finance, what I like to do is I like having just separate accounts, right? I have my cash flow portfolio, I have my real estate portfolio. If I wanted to have a growth portfolio, I would come in here and I would create a full another, you know, growth portfolio. It's still in the same login, um, but you have separate accounts. That's how I personally would do it if I was gonna have a growth and a dividend portfolio. I personally would separate them. So it's not something that you, you have to do, but I, I personally, the way that my brain thinks, I think in you know dividend stocks and I think in growth stocks and I view them, I view them separately. So let's look at, you got finance, you got Square, I mean Block, uh, you got PayPal, JP Morgan, Citibank. Yeah, I mean, these are very different. So this is, this is actually kind of cool. So you got the future up on the top and you got the past down on the bottom. PayPal and Square, like they're they're the future. JP Morgan has done very well in pivoting and acquiring other companies and really staying ahead of the game where other traditional banks necessarily haven't been able to do that or haven't done it. Citibank is okay, I guess. Um, but I, I like I actually do like these um, from a growth standpoint. I like I, I'm a big fan of these two companies. And JP Morgan, the best US bank out there. Um, let's take a look at your industrials, waste management, very cool. Caterpillar 3M. I think these are I think these are great. Uh, waiting, yeah, I think these are fine. Um, communication, Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, American, there's the American Tower, love it. Um, yeah, okay, I, I think this is fine. With your time horizon, what do you have in here? Communication at 5%? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I would, maybe you could look at Comcast. I like having T-Mobile in here as a growth a telecom growth perspective, you know, Verizon and AT&T, these are more your your traditional telecoms, right? They're, they're not gonna be growing near as fast as T-Mobile or a, you know, American Tower. Now let's take a look at your cloud. What do you got in cloud? You got CRM, Snowflake, Adobe, and JFrog. Yeah, I think these are, I think these are great. My wife owns, um, you know, Salesforce, Snowflake is great, Adobe is great, JFrog is great. These are great technology companies. I like the fact that you have really, really high quality companies in here. So you're you're not really going very, very speculative. So I like the fact that you know your time horizon, the companies that you're investing in, they're high quality companies. You got the Amazons in there, you got the Salesforce in there. You know, you're, you're investing into some really high quality dividend stocks as well in Costco, Home Depot, and McDonald's. I think this is fine. If you prefer having everything in one, I think it's okay, but me personally, over 40 years, I like having them separate. I would personally have my dividend stocks in one pie and I'd have my growth stocks in a different pie and I would view them separately. Dylan, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I hope that you learned something new. I hope that you got value out of the video. I hope you and your families stay safe during this holiday season. I hope all of you have a wonderful New Year's and I'll catch you everybody in next week's video. You know what? I think we're gonna be friends. Can everyone say hi to my friend? That's crazy. I just wanted to say thanks. I'm glad you came along, partner.